Hello, my name is Host Eric. I'm the host of Talking with Famous People. And today, in this exciting episode of Talking with Famous People, we're going to discuss tips for typing. Typing tips and tips for typing. Okay, so I've tried to type a lot of people. I get it right sometimes. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you think I'm some sort of genius typer, uh, you haven't watched enough of my show. Because I get it right sometimes. Uh, there, But given that, and given the fact that if you are typing someone in real life that you have an opportunity to see over the course of multiple days, and you have a longer period of time to look at them, you're more likely to type them correctly, obviously. And I will also say regarding that, that um, you want to look a lot at what, they're, what they talk about, right? You want to pay attention to what they talk about. But regardless... I'm getting distracted by the chat as whimsical Kit Kats is apologizing for using gendered language, uh, <laughs> which makes me laugh. Um, just because it's so it's so contemporary, you know. Only millennials do that sort of stuff. Uh, anyhow, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about tips for typing. That's a way to type generation. If somebody's talking, if somebody apologizes for using gendered language, they're probably a millennial. Regardless, uh, I always start with the feeling aspect of things, and whether they're extroverted feeling or introverted feeling. And the reason I start there is because it seems to me, in general, one of the easier ways to type somebody. If you see somebody who's engaging in a lot of what you would call formal dancing around, like, I hope you don't mean I think, I hope you don't mean I said, I hope you didn't think I meant blah, 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 blah when I said that, or, or, hey, uh, remember when you asked me if, if blah, 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 did you mean that I, that you thought that I was being too arrogant about something? If you're, if people are talking about perceptions in that fashion, then they're probably using F-E and they're not using it very well. So, like, that, if you hear people saying those kind of things, that's a good sign of an ENTP uh, or potentially an ESTP might do that as well, although they're a lot less likely to. However, for somebody who's using F-E in the dominant slot or the second slot, they're going to be a lot more smooth with it. So one thing I would make note of is generally how socially smooth somebody is. People who use introverted feeling are often can often be pretty socially smooth as well, but they're less overtly smooth and they're sort of more naturally smooth. Uh, and so if you see somebody who's who's got a certain amount of smoothiness to them, then you're probably looking at somebody who's got FE in the first or second slot. Now, <laughs> that's so skin. That's who that that sexy vested bearded man is. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that's a vest. I think that's a V neck. I think he's going V neck. Is that a V neck or what? Yeah, it's an undershirt. Oh, it's an undershirt. No, it's an undershirt. Doing things a little bit casual today. I just got in from outside. Well, good news, Hoskin. We don't have a dress code. Um, it's good. The uh, so. But another tip regarding regarding FE is if you're going to ask them questions directly, I really like the question that says, "Will you give them two options, both of which sound like sentences that people might actually say that sound good, that are good representations of your type?" So the, the sentences I like to use are, you know, for the FE type, we'll identify with, "I'm not fussy, My, I'll, I'll be cool, whatever." But I, if, if they're cool, I'm worrying about them, them being cool because they're fussy. It, it, FE people are likely to see others as fussy and themselves as not fussy, whereas FI people are likely to see, uh, are likely to identify with a sentence that goes like, uh, "I need to worry about my own feelings." Those people can take care of themselves, which is a sensible enough attitude to have. So, I mean, I tend to uh, extroverted intuitors don't shut up, ENTPs don't shut up, ESTPs are not necessarily particularly talkative. 
ESFPs are probably a little more targeted than ESTPs. But yeah, ENTPs don't uh, shut up. NFJs or uh, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? Go ahead. Well, uh, I want to say that I have an ENTP friend and, e and ESTP friend. ESTP one it doesn't shut up at all. He's the more more talkative one. Interesting. Okay, yeah. well, I'll, make, I'll include that in my thoughts. Uh, extrovert, because the, the ESTP I know, I only know one in real life, and he's not particularly talkative. Uh, maybe, I, I, I just remember that I know two. But one of them is very talkative, I don't know why. Too much. <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's like always trying to push his, his agenda, whatever he is. He, he doesn't know anybody, and then he just starts talking. And, Talking about his thing, I don't know. It's like almost in something it's in his head. I see. Uh, okay. Well, anybody else want to give any tips on distinguishing between extroverted feelers and introverted feelers? Uh, I'm gonna just pile that away. I'll make a note of that. That sometimes the STPs are talkative because I haven't encountered them. I seem to go with what I've encountered as much as it's like part what I encountered and part what the, what the model says and part just what I feel like saying. <laughs> So. Specifically, extroverted and introverted feelers. You said, yeah, yeah. Distinguishing between extroverted and introverted feelers. Anyone have anything they want to add to my basic uh, perceptions notion that extroverted feelers are interested in managing perceptions more? So, I mean, they're also interested in actually. They're, they have actual concern for other people's feelings. This is evidenced by. Abraham always noticing when somebody's sitting alone in a restaurant and feeling bad and and wanting to do something but not really being able to do anything. I think uh, introverted feelers are uh, more sensitive than extroverted feelers. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, here's the thing: they're they're more likely to get their feelings hurt. Yeah, I yeah, think that's what I, I mean. I think the extroverted feelers are just as prone to agitation, though. And if they're not aware that it's agitation and not an actual emotion, then they can think of themselves as being particularly emotional, not realizing that it's just them getting pissed off by other people, not necessarily getting hurt by other people. Hmm. Over, overactive, negative extroverted feeling would be even more sensitive than introverted feeling. Because then, if someone's saying something to them, it's feedback from another person. Whereas introverted feeling doesn't quite care about that quite as much. Okay, so... So is, so is wait, those damn negatives. Uh, yeah, can you... Negative. Effie, say, it, say that again. I didn't quite catch all that. Can you say it again? When... An extroverted feeler is using negative extroverted feeling. Uh, uh, they're trying to avoid people perceiving them poorly. They can get really upset if they get negative feedback. Hmm. So if it doesn't yeah. work, if it doesn't work, it upsets them. <laughs> they, they're like always trying to please people, right? That's what you meant. Well, yeah, they're trying to shape. They're sh trying to shape other people's perceptions of them. It's not necessarily to to please them. You know, sometimes I try to shape somebody's perceptions of me to try to make them think, "Don't fuck with Eric." You know, that's not to please them. It's to make them scared of me. Like, extroverted feeling, it can channel other feelings. Like if it's trying to channel positive fi, it would try to make other people like you. But if it's trying to channel, like, some other, like, the reptilian instincts, Bomber it might be trying fire. to make other people scared of you. I mean, and, and, but when I, when I do that, I'd like to think it's pretty rational. It's like, this person is, keeps getting in my way, and I need them to realize they need to get in somebody else's way, not mine. And so I come down on them, you know? But it's, it's not, it's not un, unwarranted. It's not for no reason. It's like, they keep getting in my way, you know? But yeah, the it's it's okay. 
Let's see. Yeah. Go go ahead if you got something, Mega Bro. No, I lost it. Okay. So Eric asks, what is the definition for charge, i.e. negative and positive? I'm interested just on the charge alone. He wants to know if you have a definition for the charge itself without relating it to any particular function. Okay, well if you ever if you've ever heard of a negative feedback loop, that would be something that tries to stop a change in a system or reduce a change. Like if your thermostat in your house runs on a negative feedback loop, if the temperature goes above a set point, the the thermos the air conditioner will try to cool the house down. You'll if so the temperature is higher than set point, it's hotter, the system will react with trying to inject cold into itself so that it maintains the set point. Uh, so the, so the negative feedback loop tries to reduce uh, differences from set point. So um, a positive feedback loop would look for something unusual and magnify it. Um, I suppose if you had like a vibration sensor, oh, I can't think of a good physical example of a positive feedback. Okay, a snowball rolling down a hill would be a positive feedback loop. It would just get bigger until it ran out of energy or hit the bottom of the hill. Um, so, in cognitive functions, like a positive feedback loop for a cognitive function would be trying to use the, the function is trying to get more and more input or more and more differences in input. Can I, can I make an analogy here to audio compression? It sounds to me Mega Bro, that if anybody knows how audio compression works, that you're talking about the negative feedback loop as being functioning kind of like audio compression, where you tell the compressor, I'd like the, the maximum level to be minus 1 dB. And anything that's over minus 5 dB, you're going to start reducing the volume of it. If it's only a little bit over minus 5 dB, you're only going to reduce the volume a little bit. If it's a little more, you're going to reduce the volume a little more. If it's a little more, you're going to reduce it a little more. But it's not going to be equal to... So it's like it'll still be a little bit louder than its preceding thing, but it won't be much louder. You know what I'm saying? Right. But um, that, that's how the, audio compression machine, works. If you know that, then I think that's how negative the negative charge works. But the feedback would be like the would the feedback itself would be the amount of multiplying of volume. Uh. So if the signal is too loud, then the multiplier gets smaller. And if the signal's too quiet, the multiplier gets larger on the negative feedback loop. Okay, um, yes. So you have, you have bo boost low, it's, it's audio compression with boost low signals on. <laughs> uh, so with like, introvert sensing is pretty easy to talk about. Uh, like positive feedback loop of introverted sensing would try to copy as many things as it possibly can. And a negative feedback loop of introverted sensing would try to make existing information as stable as it possibly can. So, add nothing new. Or if something new comes, resist it. Uh. Interesting. Right. Well, that's that's a good explanation right there. I feel like I understand it a little bit better. You've explained it to me before. It hasn't really settled into my brain so that I actually Im implement it as part of my analysis like I ought to because I think it's very informative. I think it makes perfectly good sense. I think it does a better job of explaining what's going on than the model without those charges. So um, I'm, I will begin utilizing that, and I'll probably use it wrong a few times. I think Meg is going to have to correct me like 10 or 15 times before I finally get it down. But I'm, know, still, he, so I'm still working. 
He seems I, pretty patient. I, I, I something I was, that uh, I was going to ask real quick is, does positive charge and negative charge always indicate uh, that when something is positively charged that it is uh, to say that it's better if something's negatively charged, that it would be the opposite, or are they sort of distinct from that no, correlation? No, it, it wouldn't really mean that. Now, it okay. frequently does, but it doesn't always. Um, positive just means it's... Uh, positive is just probably going to react to things that are unusual, but within the domain of the function. It's the math and, curve and thing. It's it, yeah. The, the positive and negative don't refer to good and bad. It's a math curve kind of a thing, you know. Now, when it hits feelings, then that usually does uh, associate with positive and negative feelings. But with uh, sensing and thinking, you wouldn't really notice it. Now, host Ken, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Whimsical Kit Kats has just challenged you to an eyebrow breakdance battle. <laughs> So she can, you better, she can fucking try. She, you better get those, you better get those brows warmed up. Okay. Uh, I did not challenge you. Said, I think you're making shit up, Eric. She says random side note. I think Ken can pull off a sidekick brow, a sick eyebrow dance battle against a break dancer. See, I interpreted that to mean she challenged you to an eyebrow break dance battle. It's not wrong, Kit Kat. It's just interpretive. It's, it's not. It's. You know, it's it's not really that I can break dance with the eyebrows. It's I, I'm pretty much a one trick pony, which is furrowed brow and then raised <laughs> one. It's pretty much that's, that's that's a pretty good that's a pretty good yeah, eyebrow I'm, trick I'm though. A, I'm a meat and potatoes eyebrow actor. I don't so get all. Cake look going on. Got the what now? The beefcake look. <laughs> beefcake. I don't even like. I weigh like. 194. I'm not nearly beefcake enough. He's talking to me, host Ken. I'm the only oh. beefcake here, all right? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait, where's my arm? Does that count as beefcake? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I don't really count as beefcake. Did we suddenly move to Boston all of a sudden? I feel like I, the podcast I, has taken place in Boston now. We're yeah. Not We're not orange enough. Well, regardless... I am, uh... <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I have any of those shirts, Whimsical Kit Kats. In fact, I'm quite sure I don't have any of those kind of shirts. I have none of them. I don't have undershirts because I only wear t-shirts. Why would I wear an undershirt under a t-shirt? Taylor seems to want to wear an undershirt under his t-shirt. Why? I don't know. I could get a plastic bag. I'm sure that would look Do, great. Is there is there a current topic going on right now? Because if not, I have a story to tell. All right, well, let's stop this video and hear your topic. We were talking positive, negative. Then we were talking undershirts, which was an important side side topic there. I'm glad we got that taken care of. And now we're going to hear about Host Ken's story. Thanks for watching, talking with famous people. I have been Host Eric with an array of famous peoples and hosts in the room. And here we go.